I'm Sharenda, the Director of Student Activities, Commuter Services, and Leadership Development. And my office is in conjunction with Student Government Association and Student Activities Board hosting this evening's tool session, the first of the academic year. Woo woo! <laughs> yeah, we're excited. Um, and before Emma comes to do the introduction of our guest speaker, I'm going to play a little game with you. Yeah, and it's called um, Get to Know Your Neighbors, and we're all going to move to the same neighborhood. What that means is if you are not in the first row, please move to the first row and then to the second row, to the third row, and into the center, okay? And the reason why we're doing this is because um, this will happen. Mishka will rearrange the houses. Um, but also, uh, when Dave is doing the presentation, there's going to be some interaction and sometimes for question and conversation, it's going to be easier if we're all together than if we're all spread out. So thank you for your cooperation, Mishka. And now I am going to turn it over literally to Emma who's going to do the intro. Emma is from Student Government Association. Welcome Emma. Hi everyone. So our speaker today lives in the metro in Metro Atlanta and is known as American America's student leadership trainer based on his speaking and training over 400 times for more than 200 different colleges and universities. He is an expert on campus clubs and organizations serving leadership for students in parliamentary procedure. He has been a leader in student government on his campus, a local, state, and national officer for a collegiate service organization, and a highly decorated state advisor. He would be sharing his insights and knowledge today and welcomes your questions on any leadership topics or issues you may have. He is also the author and recently published book, The Sermon on the Mount, The Greatest Motivational Speech Ever, which you can purchase a signed copy of today for just $10. Please welcome Dave Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you all. I appreciate you all being here. Uh, how many of you are here for me and how many of you are here for Mishka? For maybe I don't want to know. Maybe I don't want to know. Uh, as Emma told you, I am Dave Kelly. I am known as America's Student Leadership Trainer because that's the title that I gave myself. I think titles made up or taken are better than ones earned or elected, but I know a lot of you are in elected roles, perhaps in student government, in clubs and organizations, maybe in Greek life, and so what we're going to talk about here today will help you in that. But here's the other thing to realize with parliamentary procedure, it's actually a skill that you can use your whole life. There uh, will be opportunities for you. My wife was the president of our homeowners association. She knew parliamentary procedure very well. She was able to use it there and be very effective. For two years, I was the president of a trade association in the mortgage business in Georgia. Use parliamentary procedure there. Uh, in civic groups, there's gonna be opportunities. If you go into nonprofit work, or any of you ever serve on a board, you're gonna have opportunities to use parliamentary procedure. So it's not just here while you're in school, but it's something that you'll be finding that you'll be able to use your whole life. So that's what we, I hope that you'll be able to see, and I'll be sharing with it here. But we've got enough time where if you have questions on anything that I bring up, or you go, Ooh, this happened at our meeting. What should we have done? Feel free to ask those questions because other people may have those same questions too. So uh, that's, I encourage that and welcome that. And so let's get into this thing of parliamentary procedure. First of all, what is it? And you should have a handout. Looks like they're all yellow. It's a fill in the blank handout, so it's not a test. You don't have to worry about completing that but uh, I'll be giving you the answers up on the screen and be talking about those. So uh, the, your fill-ins should be bolded and underlined in most cases. So what is this? This is the way we run our meetings. It's how we get things done. It's our customs, it's our ethics. It's just things that we do in meetings. And it, where does it come from? It literally comes from Parliament in England. Uh, that's why it's called parliamentary procedure. It's the procedures that they followed and used and then they were adopted by a guy we'll talk about in a few moments named Robert. And what does it allow us to do? It allows us to, to have opinions heard and make decisions without confusion, hopefully without chaos, without uh, people getting upset with each other. Now, that doesn't mean things won't get emotional or get heated, but parliamentary procedure is intended to give everyone a voice and then allow you to make a decision. 
Okay. At its root, what parliamentary procedure is, is uh, the majority rule. We've all heard that phrase, right? Uh, the majority rules, but the minority has a voice too. And the minority would be that opinion that isn't going to prevail, but it is still an important opinion to be heard. And so that's what parliamentary procedure allows us to do. For student organizations, Parley Pro, which is what us cool kids call it, is intended to allow you to make decisions and get stuff done. You ever been in a meeting or an organization where nothing's getting done? Yeah, because there's chaos going on? Sure. And this will help you to get through it. Now, have every of you ever been in a situation where someone did know parliamentary procedure so well that they could use it as a weapon against other people? Any of you ever seen that? Yeah? When I was in school, I was one of those people. I knew it better than everybody else, and I uh, usurped the authority of our student government vice president and took control of our student senate. Back then, I used my powers for evil. Now I use them for good. So I'll teach you how not to be like me. Where does it originally come from? A man named Sir Thomas Smith wrote the book on parliamentary procedure. He put down the rules of parliament in 1583, so over 430 years ago. But some of the things that he wrote about we still follow today, that you can only discuss one thing at a time. Have you ever heard that phrase, there can only be one motion on the floor at a time? That's where it comes from. Personal attacks in debate are to be avoided. You're not in Congress. Don't go for personal attacks. Okay, you're supposed to talk about the merits of the topic, whatever it might be, not, um, oh, well, you're a stupid head. No, that's not proper debate. Uh, maybe in third grade it would be, but not here. Uh, and uh, you can also divide motions where maybe most everyone's in favor of something, but maybe on the other end of it, there's a part they don't like. Give you an example. Sometimes when I do this, I do a three or four hour session where we do a mock meeting. And I was out in Seattle one time, and I had about five or six colleges there participating, about 50 students, and we did a mock meeting, and one of the schools proposed a, a motion. That we, we do a mock meeting, we call ourselves Awesome State University, and it's our mock Senate meeting, and they proposed a motion that there should be a smoking ban on campus because at that time the state of Washington hadn't actually passed a law on that. And I said, okay, well that sounds good. Do you, do you have anything else with it? Penalties? And they said, yeah, they had three penalties. The first time you get caught, you get a reprimand. Second time you get caught, it's academic probation. Third time you get expelled. Like, okay, that seems pretty intense, but it's a fake thing, so why not? But then another school raised their hand and they said, oh, we have a smoking ban motion too. And I said, okay, what's yours? And they basically said the same thing about a smoking ban. And I said, do you have penalties? And they said, yes, we just have one. If you get caught smoking on campus, it's punishable by death. And I'm like, oh, let's do yours. <laughs> and so we started debating it. And of course, everybody was for the smoking ban, but not so much the death penalty. So I said, you remember when I told you you could divide it? This would be a case where you would want to make a motion to divide, to approve the smoking ban, get that done with, and then you deal with the penalty later on. Probably not something you're going to use a lot, but I'd like to share that. And occasionally I have someone contact me and go, oh, we did that dividing thing. It worked out so great. So now you know that it is possible, something you can do. All right, let's talk about this guy, Robert. Who is he? His, actually, Robert is his last name. His name was uh, Henry uh, Matten Robert. He was a Brigadier General in the U.S. Army, in the Union Army, and he published his rules in 1876. We still follow them today. This is the 11th edition. So in 140 years, they've only published 10 revisions. Uh, you don't really need to know all of this to be effective with parliamentary procedure, particularly in student organizations. There's a lot in here that's not going to apply to you. I haven't read this whole book, but I'm pretty familiar with it. So what's great about the book is it's a great resource if something comes up that you're not sure of. And sometimes people will ask me questions that I think I know, but then I can confirm them in here. So I'm not going to go through this whole book. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a, a version of it that I think will help you in student organizations. So he wrote this because he was asked to lead a meeting at his church and he didn't know how to do it. So he came up with his rules and we still typically follow them to this day. So what happens at a meeting? First of all, you call the meeting to order. Sometimes people hit a gavel, maybe they'll ring a little bell, you could even use a clapper, smack a freshman, whatever you need to do to, to get the meeting going. 
It's the idea you get everyone's attention and you want to get business done. Then you determine whether or not you have a quorum for your meeting. Now, if you're in a club or organization here on campus, uh, student government, Greek life, quorum is going to be set forth in your constitution or in your bylaws. It's the number of people you have to have at a meeting in order to get things done. Usually, 50% of the members. So that'll be spelled out there. If you don't have a quorum, then you can still talk about things, you just can't take votes. When I was the president of that trade association, we rarely got quorum because we had people from all over the state of Georgia and I just couldn't get them to come to a meeting. And so we would make decisions, we would, would reach consensus, and then we'd have to do mail out votes. So those types of things are covered under Robert as well. So that's quorum. Then your minutes. Do we have any secretaries in here? of clubs or organizations, a couple of you. The minutes are not supposed to be a transcript. Now, I haven't seen your minutes, don't know which organization you're talking about. It's not supposed to be a transcript of everything that's said. It's really supposed to be a summary of actions taken, who was there, uh, major things, maybe some key components of things that were discussed, but not Dave said this, and Haley said that, and Jimmy said this, and then Sharinda said that. It's not intended to be all that. So here is a template that you uh, can take a look at. That template is on the last two pages of your handout too. So those of you who are secretaries or those of you who have secretaries, share that template with them and you can just use that as a fill in the blank format for doing your minutes. You can also go to my website and it's on my blog page if you wanna print that out from there and print out a bunch of copies. So that'll help you in putting your minutes together so that it doesn't become such a big Thing. Your minutes should not take hours to write. And then also at meetings, you have officer reports, committee reports. You would have things that you do every week perhaps or at every meeting that are similar in form but not the exact same thing. Robert calls that special orders. You don't have to. You might, uh, I work with a student government in Louisiana that has an open forum for students to come and bring up issues. That's different every week. It's technically a special order, but they call it open forum. They also have a section during their meeting where the student senate can just bring up any topic and they call it topics for the good of the body, okay? That's where this fits, but again, you're not gonna probably call it that. But if you ever see that term in something, then that's what it is. Then you have old business, you have new business. So old business is stuff left over from previous meetings. New business would be new stuff that people wanna bring up. I move that we have a blood drive for the American Red Cross. Okay, that would be new business. And then you have a motion, and we're gonna talk about those in a little bit. You'd have announcements, and then you'd have adjournment. Adjournment can happen one of three ways. You can uh, have a motion to adjourn, you can have the person who's running the meeting say something to the effect, which is how I usually end a meeting, is there any other business to come before us today? Seeing none, meeting adjourned. Or you can have a specific time. Uh, seeing as the time for this workshop is supposed to end at 8.30 and it's now 8.31, unless there's any objection, this meeting would be adjourned. See how I did that? Now, if you have a motion, someone moves, I move that we adjourn, it has to be seconded. I'm gonna talk about seconding later, but what it basically means is at least one other person agrees that you should do this thing in the group and then you immediately vote on it. This is one of the few things you don't debate, even though parliamentary procedure is supposed to protect debate. Now having said that, I did it once. And I knew I wasn't supposed to, but I did it anyway. I was the state advisor for a collegiate group called Circle K, and it's affiliated with Kiwanis. And if you have a key, had a key club in your high school, that's all the same family. And at our state convention, our students had voted to raise their state dues, $2. That had to be approved by the state Kiwanis board before it could be sent on to the national office to be added into their bills. So it had to be approved by a certain time or we'd have to wait a year to implement it. Well, I happened to be on the state board of Kiwanis that year too. So I'm sitting there at a meeting and our, our person, he was called the governor, not like on Walking Dead, not that kind of governor, but you know, uh, this is what we call the top person in the state. So he's the governor and he was a retired lieutenant colonel from the army. And so he's running the meeting and he ran a very tight ship. And so he's going through, is there any old business? Seeing none, because he didn't know of any. It's, is there any new business? He didn't know of any. Is there any announcements? He didn't know of any. 
Motion to adjourn. And at this point, over here, I'm sitting over here at New Business and I'm trying to get his attention, but he can't see me because I'm right off to the side. And finally, if somebody makes a motion to adjourn and then seconds it, and he's about to take a vote, and I jump up and I said, guys, wait! We can't do this. I need us to vote on this thing that I just explained to all of you. And they're all like, what? Okay. And our, um, our governor, who we called Coach, had his gavel and he was literally twirling it. Because apparently, lieutenant colonels from the army don't like it when they get interrupted. I learned that that day. Well, I explained to him, and I said, guys, you have to vote this down. I was out of order because I debated something you can't debate, but I knew Coach didn't know that. Sometimes you use your evil for good. And so I got them. They voted down the motion to adjourn. I made my motion to approve the dues increase. Second, no debate, they were ready to get out of there. Voted it in, and then he says, all right, now, do I have a motion to adjourn? He goes, is that okay with you, Dave? You got it, coach. Second it, voted, and we were out of there. So the thing with this is, don't let this stuff get you all tied up in knots. It's more important that you get things done right and then following some sort. Yeah, I'm not saying don't follow the procedure, but if, if you get into a situation like that, Take a step back, take a breath. When you get on a nonprofit board, probably can't do that. Or in some businesses, you probably can't do that. Or a shareholder meeting, you can't do that. But in college, it's okay to make mistakes. And it's okay to learn from those mistakes. So look at it that way and don't get all caught up. Although if somebody calls you on it, then if they're right, you kind of have to go with them. All right, so what else do, can we do? In your meetings, the way that members get their say is by making motions. I move that we have a, a blood drive for the Red Cross. Somebody seconds it, you discuss it, and then you take a vote. Motions, there's four kinds of motions. Main motions are what I just said. They introduce a topic and some sort of action to be taken. Blood drive for the Red Cross. Pretty straightforward. And then you debate it and you take a vote. But there's some other motions that can affect main motions. A subsidiary motion is any motion that changes a main motion. That's where you've ever heard of amendments to the motion. That's where this comes into play. And it can be something like, it could be like with this example, I move that we have a blood drive for the American Red Cross. That's our motion. I move to amend the motion by adding on November 15th, whatever day that would be. And somebody seconds it. When you have an amendment, you have to talk about it and discuss it before you go back to the original thing. So in this case, we would debate whether or not we want to have that be the date. And then if we vote in favor of that, it's part of the original motion. If we vote against it, well, in the example I gave, then there would be no date. We would just be moving to do it. So that maybe somebody would want to amend it to do a different date. So that's what subsidiary motions do. They, um, they change things. Then there are the uh, privileged motions. These are things like points of, points of privilege, tabling, uh, calling for the orders of the day, which is a fancy way of saying, could we please go back to the agenda? Really sitting here, we're sitting here, we're talking about Avengers Endgame. Come on, we gotta go back to the agenda. Call for the orders of the day. Now, if you, point of privilege, what is that? A point of privilege is something, it can be something of a comfort, Point of personal privilege, it's really hot in here, could we turn down the, uh, the, the heat? Could we put on some AC? That's a point of personal privilege. Another point of personal privilege would be like, point of personal privilege, I really need to leave the room for a minute, okay? That could be a point of personal privilege. It can be anything like that. Now, I'll give you an extreme example. Something that happened about a month ago was in the news. A group called the Democratic Socialists of America had a convention, and they were having their business meeting and as they were having the meeting, they were debating whatever, and people were listening, and, and one person got up and they said, point of personal privilege, I'm trying to hear the debate, but there's a lot of whispering and other conversations going on, and I have issues with sensory attention, focusing in on what people are saying with all this other noise. So they said, so if we could cut out all the background noise, I would really appreciate it, guys. That led somebody else to jump up and say, point of personal privilege, I would appreciate if we didn't use gender-specific language in this body, because they said guys. I kind of thought guys was an inclusive term nowadays for everybody, but it wasn't that day. Then the first person gets up, 
I would appreciate, point of personal privilege, I would appreciate it if members of this body would not attack other people in this body. And so this kept going on till they got to a point, not kidding, where people were offended when people would clap when stuff passed. So someone made a point of personal privilege asking that instead, if they wanted to show their approval, that they simply did jazz hands. And about that point, the meeting fell apart and everyone left. So when you get to that point, maybe take a break and figure out what's going on in your meeting so that hopefully it doesn't get to that point. And then your last ones are incidental motions. These are really more of things. A point of order is, uh, are you, or a point of parliamentary inquiry is, are you applying procedure correctly? Are you doing this the right way? Now, I'm not going to get into all those points, but on page 10 of your handout, I do have all four of the points that typically uh, come about in, in Robert's rules. And so you can look at that there and see when you can interrupt a speaker and when you can't interrupt a speaker. Point of personal privilege, the building is on fire. I would like to leave the room. You can interrupt a speaker for that, okay? So, but there's some things you're not supposed to interrupt for. Any questions on that? Anybody ever get caught up in all that stuff, the points of, of things? I had one school tell me where they had someone who was in their student government who would use point of personal privilege to basically just debate everything. And it, they, they wouldn't call on him, so he would just make points of personal privilege. That's not how it's supposed to be used. Yeah. For the question of privilege, so what, what would you use when you're trying to get back to, like, asking where the meeting at? You use that would be a call for the orders of the day. So it's like call for the orders of the day. Basically, the idea is return to the agenda, but it can also be, uh, or you could do a point of information to say, wait a minute, I'm, I'm confused as to where we are. So that, you could do either one of those. Point of information would be perfect. And you can interrupt for a point of information. Because if you have that question, somebody else might have that question. And so it's important to get that clarified. So good question. So anyone else? Yeah, Sharinda. I apologize. I meant to do that. Uh, she asked about a point of uh, that if you're on an amendment or a motion and you're not quite sure what you're talking about or where you are, what would you do? And that would be where you would uh, ask for a point of information. And, uh, or you could do, uh, if you're off track and you're not sure where things are in the agenda, you could call for the orders of the day. So that's, that was the question and that was it. So thank you for asking me for that. Anyone else have a question while we're at that point? Points? Point of order. All right, let's go on to questions. Questions about motions. Your motion uh, has to relate to the business at hand. The phrase is germane. When we talk about uh, things being germane, it means it has to apply to what you're debating. So, for example, uh, Congress many times will amend things and attach stuff that has nothing to do with it. Like they'll have a civil rights bill and they'll amend it to attach a nuclear weapon system to it. I don't know how they can do that, but they have their own rules and Congress has been around longer than Robert, so they got to go with it. But in your case, you should make sure things apply. Now, again, when I was out in Seattle another year, we did this and we had a motion by one of the schools that the school mascot for Awesome State University would be Barney the Dinosaur. And that every time a person on campus went into a classroom or any room in the building on campus, they had to sing the Barney song. And that the school had to buy a Barney costume as the mascot. So we were debating this. I let them do some silly things because it made it more fun and it's the same process. Well, somebody made an amendment to change the mascot costume to Captain Planet. And I know some of you are going, oh, it should be Captain Planet. And someone seconded it and I allowed that and someone asked, did a point of order to ask if that was germane, if it applied and, because it was a different mascot. And I said, well, first of all, I think Captain Planet will be more fun but second of all, actually, since it's a mascot costume, it still applies, it's still germane, it still is relevant to the main motion. And it's up to the group to debate whether or not you should have a costume that matches your mascot. That would seem to make sense, but under parliamentary procedure, that motion, that amendment was actually in order. So even if it, it can make a change like that, if it applies to what you're talking about, then you could still make that kind of motion, even though it, wouldn't, it might not seem to make sense. That's what debate is for. Everybody kind of clear on that? 
So uh, that's, that's when you would discuss these types of things. Do you need a second? Yes. I can't really think of a case in, really in student organizations or any other thing I've done where I didn't need a second. There are some really basic, uh, really minuscule things that Robert talks about that I just have never come across. So if you ever have a question on that, it'll never hurt you to have a second. But if you're unsure and someone says, oh, we don't need a second for this, that's where you want to look it up. By the way, there are uh, editions of Robert's Rules from like the 1940s and earlier that are out of copyright. You can actually print those out. It is legal to do that uh, if you want just the very basic things. There's going to be a lot of newer things that are not contemplated in there, but if you want to, or you just want to look them up online, the whole text will be there and you can actually Google that and look those things up. And then is it debatable? Pretty much everything is because that's the whole point of Robert's Rules of Parliamentary Procedure is to be able to debate things. Now, like I mentioned, a motion to adjourn is not. A motion to table is not. We're going to get to that. And a motion to call the question is not. And we'll get to that as well. These are all phrases you might have heard, but those are some things that are not debatable. Points of order or other points are not debatable. They're basically you're asking a question. Are you applying procedure correctly? Uh, I need a point of information, I have a question about what we're talking about, those types of things um, wouldn't be debatable because you're asking questions. Can it be amended? Anything that can be debated can be amended. So a motion to adjourn could not be debate, could not could be amended, but anything else could be. And what amending does is it allows you to make it more acceptable to you. You can be against the main motion, but you can be for an amendment to that motion. For example, Let's say there was a motion to have this training on um, Monday, October 14th, and uh, th that we would do it here in this, this auditorium. And somebody seconds it, and as you're debating it, you're like, oh, I don't want to go to parliamentary procedure training. I mean, I don't want to do that. I already know all that stuff. And besides, the Packers and Lions are playing a Monday night football, which they did, and the Packers need to win that game, which they did. I'm a Packer fan, and so I, I don't want to do that. So you make a motion to change it to be Tuesday, October 15th. And then you, can, you make that motion to amend it. Someone seconds it. You can debate it. You can say, let's do it on Tuesday. That's a better day. It's more natural for us to have a Tuesday. Monday's actually a holiday. Some people might go home. So let's do it on uh, Tuesday. And everybody goes, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We want to watch the game too. And so then you vote for it, you vote in favor of the amendment, now the main motion comes up, and now the motion is to have a parliamentary procedure workshop on Tuesday, October 15th, and you debate against it. See, you can be for the amendment because it makes it more acceptable to you, but you can still be against the main motion. Everybody clear on that? So do amending in order, so that if it does pass, even if you don't want it to, that it'll be the way you want it. And if, if they, the group approves it, then obviously it's the way the rest of the group wants it too. So you can do that. How many amendments can you have on a motion? As many as it takes. At the end of this, I'm going to tell you about the magically, mysteriously disappearing motion. It was a motion I had when I was international president of that collegiate group, Circle K, that had, it was a motion with an amendment to the motion, with an amendment to the amendment to the motion, with an amendment to the amendment to the amendment to the motion, six deep. I'm going to tell you what we did with it. Stay tuned. All right, uh, what kind of vote is needed? Usually motions only take a 50% vote. Elections sometimes will take 50% plus one, and then usually things like removing somebody from office will take two thirds. Now for a campus organization, for those types of things, something like as extreme as that, Look at your bylaws or your constitution. Sharinda, are those kept in your office? Are there a copy there? So if constitutions, if you don't have a copy of it, you should get one. But that's where you would get that, is from that office. And you can look that up. Hopefully it doesn't come to that. But I have seen some schools uh, where it takes three-fourths to remove somebody from office. So don't assume that it's going to just be two-thirds. If your constitution doesn't address it, most of the time, by tradition, or even sometimes in the constitution, it'll say anything not covered you default to Robert's rules, and Robert says it takes two-thirds to remove somebody from office. But you can certainly have a different standard. Okay? If you do, then that takes precedence. And then, um, can it be reconsidered? Things to be reconsidered, what does that mean? Well, that means that we may be past something, and now we have to get out of the meeting and we're like, oh, we shouldn't have done that. 
Or maybe you've defeated something and it's like, oh, we really should have done that. I'll give you an example. The very first time I was ever going to go to a school and do this program, it was a school in Louisiana, and their student senate approved me coming and passed it and approved uh, the funding for the program. And then in the intervening week, one of the senators changed her mind. She didn't want to do it. And she wanted to bring it back up. And so their advisor called me and asked me how they could do that. And I said, you want me to tell you how to defeat a motion to bring me to campus when I've already bought a plane ticket? That's really not in my best interests. But I'm a professional, so I told her. Motion to reconsider. What that means is you have something where a decision was made, either in favor or not, and you want to bring it back up again. Now, you could just make a new motion. But if you want to have the original motion, you would make a motion to reconsider. Let's say I'm running the meeting, and she goes, I want to make a motion to reconsider. Did you vote with the side that won? Now, in this case, if we're asking that person, it was a, a female senator asking her if um, she voted in favor. She did. You have to have been on the winning side to make a motion to reconsider. Okay? So, yes, that, that senator was allowed to do that. But then also, it has to be seconded by someone who was on the winning side and basically has changed their mind. Or they were on the winning side and they just want to debate it some more because they want to see what's up. That's okay, too. You don't have to be for something to second it. So in that case, nobody, else, nobody would second it. So it died for lack of a second. But that's how you do a motion to reconsider. So if you've got something like that, you can bring it back. That's what it allows you to do, is to bring something back. If the motion had originally been defeated and they had changed their mind, then somebody who voted no would have to have made that motion. So probably not something you're going to use a lot, but know that it's there if you ever need it. And it's a good way to help you not have to re redo or reinvent the wheel. So how do we make a motion? You obtain the floor. You get recognized by whoever's running the meeting. You say, Madam Chairman... I, the great Senator Kingslayer, would like to move that we have a workshop on Tuesday, October 15th. Okay, so you probably aren't going to be quite that formal in your things, but that's how Robert Ward's things, so I like to do it that way. And I'll tell you, when I was international president of that collegiate group, I was always referred to as President Dave, which was pretty awesome. Best 12 months of my life. And at the next year, at the big convention, when my successor was elected and installed, and everybody came up and was hugging me and saying, oh, you did a great job, see, you know, goodbye, and then he went to go uh, congratulate him. My father came up to me and he said, well, Citizen Dave, how does it feel? I'm like, wow, way to deflate my ego, Dad. But anyway, it is kind of fun to be in those leadership roles. Uh, so how do you make your motion? Speak affirmatively. We want to try to make motions in the positive, and if you're against it, well, then you debate against it. Not, I move that we don't have a parliamentary procedure workshop on October 15th. You move that you do, and if you're not in favor of it, then you speak against it, and then you vote against it. All right, then we wait for a second. Somebody has to second. That means at least one other person agrees you should debate it. If you don't want to debate it, don't second it. Even if they're like, guys, come on. I need this. We need to do this. Nope. If you don't want, it, if you don't want Barney the dinosaur to be the school mascot, don't second it. Then once you get into it, then the person who made the motion gets to talk first. The, the seconder gets to talk next. The chair should restate the motion and say what we're talking about so that everybody's clear on it. If you're in a bigger group, you might want to make them write it out. When I was president, we would have 500 delegates in a room, and we would have these sessions, and anything that someone wanted to move had to be written out and brought up to the head table. And we had a, a board member, the international secretary, who would receive those, and then they would type them out, and they would put them on the screen so everybody could see it. You want to make sure everyone's clear on what you're doing, and that kind of goes back to what you were asking me. If you're not clear, say, point of information, can you please read the motion again? And then the chair states it, and if the person who made it goes, wait a minute, that's not what I said, you got time to fix it. So get it fixed before you start voting on it. Any questions on that? Oh, yes. She asked if you need to be addressed by the chair to get a second, or can you just say second? I've seen it both ways. Uh, I, a lot of times, 
for me, when I run a meeting, I just go, is there a second? And then a lot of people just say, second, 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 second. I'm like, all right, um, second, right there. Put it in the minutes. Uh, in other places, uh, I've seen it where you have to raise your hand and they get called on. So either way is fine. Kind of tradition, I think most people just do, is there a second, and then they call it out. But uh, if you want to be a little more formal, uh, and maybe on a board or something like that, you would want to be. But in a lot of bodies, it's usually just sort of a, a voice thing. So good question. And it depends on how big your group is. So when we had those the delegate bodies of 500, they had to be called on because we had to get their name, their school, put it in the minutes. So yes, we did have to call on them. Usually what they would do is the person making the motion would be, we used microphones, would be at the microphone and the person who's going to second would be right behind them. That's what we did. Okay, so the, the major person who made the motion speaks first, the seconder goes next. So the person who made the motion's talking and then it's like, all right, anything else? No? All right, you made the second, what do you have to say? I just want to get my name in the minutes. Okay then, we'll move on. Now it's open for debate to everybody. All of the discussion goes through the chair. So who's ever running the meeting, everything is said to them. Because what you're talking about is for the benefit of everyone. So even though th these two might have made the motion and seconded it, you're not talking to them, you're talking to me. And then it's basically like you're talking to everybody else. I do, I've done this program now three years in a row at a school in Pennsylvania, and I actually do it during their student government meeting. So I watch their student government meeting, and then they ask me to critique them. And uh, they've gotten really good over the last couple of years. Now, maybe they just do it the day I show up. I don't know. But uh, last year, though, there was a motion made by the vice president. And the, the president was behind a podium. And there was a table up here with the executive board. And the vice president was here. And the motion was made. And people in the audience started talking directly to her and addressing her. And at some point, the president took his gavel and said, all debate is supposed to be addressed to me as the chair. And then when I got up there to do the critique, I said, that was so awesome, dude. You did that exactly right. And that's the way it should be. In my student government, we had a big square. And I didn't know this rule then. And it was just a free-for-all. People talking back and forth and all that. And that's not what it's supposed to be. So you want to have that. Now, in most clubs and organizations, we might be a little less formal with that. But then, you know, just kind of try to keep that in mind, that what you're talking about, it's not kind of the type of thing, well, gee, Joan, you're always talking about stupid things. That's not on the merits of the debate, and that's not for everybody. That's just for Joan. So you, you don't want to be doing those types of things. It's to try and keep you from attacking other people. You can only speak a second time after everyone else has spoken. Wait, what? Yeah, now again, how formal do you want to be with this? There's times where I do this where, like, especially student governments, they're like, oh, we're going to put that in effect on Monday. And that's what Robert says because he doesn't want one person to dominate the debate. So let's say this is a club meeting here, and uh, you've made a point here, and you, you talked, and then there's five other people with their hands up. And I start calling on them, and you put your hand up again. You can't talk again until I've called on all of them. But let's say before I call on you, these three over here raise their hands. You can't talk again until they go, because they haven't talked yet. Clear on that? Now, at some point, if I call on, on her using this example for the second time, and she starts debating it, and somebody else raises their hand, she gets to finish, because she's been recognized. Okay? So it's not like a hand goes up and goes, oh, sorry, got to stop talking. No, you allow that person to finish. Now, you can only talk a third time if the group votes two-thirds to let you. I, I can see light bulbs going off right now. Yes, that's actually in Robert's rules. You don't have to do anything special to start doing this, except say, the guy said, that's me, I'm a friend of Bobby, the guy said we can do this, and it's, it's actually in the rules. Again, it's intended to keep people from saying the same thing over and over again and dominating the discussion. So if they want to let them vote a third time, you have to take a vote two-thirds. And if you're going to vote two-thirds to let someone speak again, just take a vote, because more than likely you agree with that person. What's the point in, in having them speak again? Now, on these things, these um, uh, first time, second time speaking, if someone asks for a point of information, it's a point of information, what will this cost us? And I go to somebody and I say, you know, you're the treasurer, what is the information? And that person already spoke. If I'm asking them a direct question, that doesn't count as one of their times speaking. 
as long as they don't embellish and go into debate. If they just simply answer the question, then it doesn't count as one of their times. Everybody clear on that? Okay. So you can do this right away. And here's the thing, you want to avoid redundancy in your conversations, in your debates, and we're going to talk some about that. Now I want to give you a chance to write a motion. So think about something that you would like to see happen in your club, maybe on campus, maybe you want to move to have your parents raise your uh, monthly allowance or budget or whatever you have, whatever you want to do. So think of something. Now, you don't write a preamble. This is not a resolution. We're going to get into those. It's just simply, I move that. So what would you like to have happen? And I'll give a couple of you a chance to say yours, and we'll see how you did. About 15 more seconds. Okay, who's got a motion that they want to share? All right, what's your motion? Um, I move that a crosswalk be established between the Weinbrenner parking lot and the security office. I move that a crosswalk be established between the Weinbrenner parking lot and the security office. Okay, so that's very clearly an action that needs to be taken. And so I thought that that's a very clear motion. So uh, you would ask for a second. Is there a second? We have a second. And then you would have debate. And I would say, why do you think a crosswalk should be added in that spot? Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead and do it. I wish I could repeat all that, but it's, that was really good. I hope you all heard that. That's a really well thought out debate. That's the way debate should go. So good, let's give a round of applause. Or I have to teach you, I know some of you already know, not, jazz hands would have been cool right there, good point, but um, do you know the thing, did I teach you that? Yeah, all right, so I was at a school in Idaho one time and they taught me a variation on you know how you do the rock and explode it? They taught me instead that you do potato, fries. And so that's what I like to do. So we do potato fries. I got a potato fries earlier today when we were at the studio. All right, anybody else got a, a motion that they would like to share with us? Oh, Sharinda? Yes. Okay, so I'll say that again. I didn't hear the very first part. Okay, that's pretty clear. All right, uh, so it's been moved. Is there a second? Second? All right, why do you feel they should attend three events over the academic semester, faculty and staff? I feel that, number one, it's buy-in to what the students are doing to keep morale high. It's buy-in that they want to be Awesome, awesome. Let's see. You seconded it. Do you have anything you want to add? I would just like to see like, more faculty attend the events that students work really hard to put on. So I'd like to see more faculty attend the events that students really work hard to put on. Somebody else raise their hand for a second. Do you want to speak on this? Well, 
Okay. Okay. So you were waiting for that. All right. Okay. Well, is there any other debate or discussion on this? Yes. Okay, so some distance may be an issue and timing for some of the faculty and staff who live a, a good ways away. All right, so that's an interesting debate. See, and that it's okay to have disagreements. That's not even a big disagreement. That's just another point in debate. Don't be afraid of that. You've got your voice in your club or organization is, is important and other people might have be thinking the same thing, but they're thinking, oh, well, I'm the only one who thinks like that. No, you share that information. All right, so is there any other discussion on this motion? Seeing none, let's move to a vote. All those in favor of having faculty and staff attend three student-led events over the course of the semester signify by saying aye. Opposed? Na uh, abstentions? Motion carries faculty and staff. <laughs> so you see, that's how you do it. All right, any questions on that process? Okay, so good, some good motions. Uh, if you want to talk with me, because I, I, I know we've got a little uh, time here, uh, afterwards about the motion you write, I'll, wrote, I'll be happy to talk with you about that. Or even if you have questions that you were thinking of as we were doing this, uh, I am in no hurry to leave tonight, so feel free to come ask me questions about this or any other leadership topics. Uh, I'm happy to answer those for you. All right, so let's cruise along here and talk about a few other things. Putting the question, that means taking a vote. Now, typically, what I have found in my experience in getting to a vote is after we go through discussion, I'll see, is there any further discussion on this matter? Just like I just did now. Seeing none, all in favor, that's one way of doing it. Have any of you ever heard of the term calling the question? Some of you maybe. Okay, Robert doesn't like that term but it's pretty much a traditional thing in organizations. What Robert would rather you do is make a motion to end debate. That's what calling the question is. I'm tired of talking about this. People are repeating themselves. Whatever it might be, you want to just end debate and take a vote. Let's just get on with it. That's what calling the question allows you to do. So based on my research, here's what I'm going to tell you you can do. If somebody in the group says, now you can't interrupt, so in the normal flow of calling on people, I'm calling on you, I'm calling on you, I'm calling you. Then I call on her and she goes, I call the question. That means she wants to end debate. At that point, I would say, is there any objection to calling the question and moving to an immediate vote? And if there is no objection, you vote immediately on whatever the motion was. It's not debatable. You just immediately vote on that. Okay. The second part, the one Robert wants you to do. But... It is a thing in here, you can do things by unanimous consent if there's no objection. And so that's why I'm going to allow you to do that on the other. Let's say, I say she has called the question is, and to end debate, is there any uh, objection to that? Let's say somebody objects. They want to keep talking about it. There's been an objection. As the chair, I can say, would you like to put that in the form of a motion? And then she would say, I move that we call the previous question or call the question. Somebody has to second it. That's not debatable. Now you vote to end debate. Everybody clear on what I just said? Once you have a motion, you have to vote on that motion. But it's not voting on the, whatever the topic was. You're just voting to stop talking about it. It takes a two-thirds vote. So I would say, all, right, all those in favor of ending debate, signify by saying aye. And then people say aye. Opposed? Now we're going to move to a vote on the main motion of Barney the Dinosaur as our school mascot. And then somebody goes, wait a minute, wait, what did we just do? I thought we just voted on that. No, we only voted to stop talking about it. Take a pause. Make sure everybody's clear. And if you have to, do a redo. Thor is not coming down from Asgard to hit you with his hammer or Stormbreaker because you did things out of order, okay? It's, it's okay to take a pause. Now, if you're on a, a, a nonprofit board or something like that, mm, probably shouldn't, but in this case, I think it's more important to get it right than to uh, strictly adhere to something and you have people confused and they don't know what they're doing. So, and, and here's the thing, bring this handout with you to your meetings and even share it with other members of your group. I want everybody to be on the same page. That's why I'm sharing this information with you. I don't want you to have evil people like me in your organization running everything because they know parliamentary procedure better. 
I want you to kind of all be on an even keel. All right, so voting on a motion, we do it by a voice vote, we do it by a raise of our hands, maybe we stand, we do a secret ballot. Some schools actually have electronic voting in their meetings. I've heard of that, there's actually companies that sell that. I don't know that any groups are really big enough that you need that, but you can do things like that. What about the chair? When does the chair vote? Usually never, except in the case of a tie, or to make a tie. So it's either breaking a tie or making a tie. Let me give you a couple examples on this, real world examples. All right, a few years ago uh, when Betsy DeVos was being considered for Secretary of the Department of Education, they knew that it was gonna be a close vote. And the Vice President of the United States is the President of the Senate under our Constitution. Although they usually only show up in cases of ties uh, or ceremonial things. So they knew it was close, and so Vice President Pence was in the, state, in the nation's capital, in the Senate chambers, and the vote came out 50-50. And he cast a vote to break the tie to confirm her as, as Secretary of Education, okay? That's very clear, pretty clean cut uh, example. All right, so what about the idea of making a tie? If you're the chair, you can also make a tie. Let's say that there was some bill that uh, maybe the um, president, vice president, the administration doesn't want, but the Senate's gonna pass it. And so they are considering it and the vote comes out odd. Let's say it's 50 to 49, because maybe someone resigned or whatever, it just isn't there that day. In that case, the vice president could cast a vote to make a tie, which would defeat the bill. Everybody clear on that? So if it's something they don't want, you can do that. Give an example of how this happened with me in real life student organization. We had an award called the Humanitarian Award that we gave out. We gave it out to very prominent people like Rosalind Carter, who had been First Lady, uh, to Danny Thomas, who founded the St. Jude's Children's Hospitals, people like that. When it was my year as international president, we had some candidates for this award, and our committee was considering them, and it was a four-member committee, and they deadlocked on two candidates. So they brought the two candidates to the whole board to make the decision. One of them was an actress named Sally Struthers. Uh, she was on a TV show in the 70s called All in the Family. She was also uh, on Gilmore Girls. She was very well known for her work with um, feeding hungry children in Africa. I believe it was Save the Children organization. So very prominent, and that would have given us hopefully some publicity for giving her this award. But there was another person, and this is the one they deadlocked on, and he was a Boy Scout leader in the Seattle-Tacoma area, and he had built a lot of camps for Boy Scouts did some amazing work. His name was Gilbert G. Gilbert. And I'm pretty sure his middle name was probably Gilbert too, but I never confirmed that. And so that came up. Well, I'm like, well, this is a no-brainer. We should go with the person who's gonna give us more prominence, more publicity. But I had three board members from the state of Washington on a 10-member, 11-member board. And this particular meeting, one of our board members from, Louis, from Mississippi was sick and didn't come. So there were 10 people total. Well, the vote came out, five in favor of Gilbert Cubed and four in favor of Sally Struthers. And I was like, well, it, I am going to make a tie for the purpose of giving the award to both of them. Okay. One of my board members said, Dave, wouldn't that actually have the purpose of defeating it and giving it to no one? And I looked at her and I said, oh, we could do that too. She goes, no, no, we'll give it to them both. So that's what we did. Remember, evil. Six months later, it came back to bite me. We, uh, every year, the board would have to pick where the international convention was gonna be three years out. Okay, so we're debating between Baltimore and Boston. And this was always a very controversial, most political thing we would do all year. We left this for the last day we were in Indianapolis for our board meeting so that we could have everything else done. And everybody knew I wanted Baltimore because whichever city we chose, I was gonna be invited to come back and speak at that convention, and I wanted to go to Baltimore. And so they all knew this. So Sunday morning, we're all there, and everybody's ready for this debate, and I look around the room, and I look to one of my board members, and I said, Rick, where is Kathy? And he said, oh, she's downstairs typing up our committee report, because Kathy could type like this, and Rick typed like that. He's a lawyer now, by the way. And I said, oh no, you're the committee chair, you get down there and you type that report and you send her up here. Because I hated Rick and I didn't want him there anyway if I could get rid of him. So I sent him out of the room to go do the report. We debate the whole convention thing. 
it's very clear that it's coming out five to four with me also in the room. And Rick's downstairs. And so my lead Baltimore person, Carolyn, raised her hand and asked for a five minute recess. And I said, sure, and I knew she was gonna go get Rick so he could come and vote. So recess, she goes and gets him, come back. I call the meeting back to order. My parliamentarian is sitting right there next to me with his book open and he says, Rick cannot vote on this matter. I'm like, what, why not? He said, because it says right here that if you're not present for the debate, you can't vote. I said, show that to me. And I looked at it and it would be really cool if I opened to that page, but I didn't. Uh, and I go, yep, that's what it says. Rick can't vote. So we took the vote and it came out five to four. Carolyn looks at me and she says, Dave, you remember when we had that vote on that award and you made a tie? Yes. Would you make a, a, a tie now for the purpose of sending it back to the committee? Because this was something we had to make a decision on. We couldn't just vote it down. We had to pick one or the other. And they would make sure we had one more board meeting left, that Rick had his reports done and he was there for the debate this next time. And I said, you know, despite my personal feelings on this issue, Rick had a responsibility to have his work done and be here to represent his position. He wasn't, so I will not make a tie. Boston wins. It was actually a pretty good city. I had fun. Gave my speech, got a standing ovation. It was cool. So you can also refuse to make ties. You can refuse to break ties if you're running the meeting. So those are some real examples that could possibly happen to you uh, someday. A motion is pending until it has been voted on, so it's not in effect. Sometimes we take mo make motions and we think... That's it. My Kiwanis Club is really bad about that. Someone makes a motion to give the Red Cross $500. And goes, oh, okay, that's great. Let's go ahead and do that. N no, guys, we, we have to have a second. We have to debate it. We have to vote on it. It's, it's just pending right now. There's actually lawyers in that group who should know better, but they don't. Uh, tabling means that you have something that's come up, and during the course of this meeting, I move that we table this discussion to allow our speaker to make their presentation because they have a flight to catch. Okay, it's seconded, not debatable. You vote in favor of it. Person makes their presentation, they leave, and then you have a motion to remove it from the table. Very simple. But what if you wanna get rid of something more long-term? Let's say it's like, oh my gosh, this debate on Barney and Captain Planet has gone on forever. Are we ever going to take a vote? And people just keep wanting to go. And so what you do is you make a motion to postpone it indefinitely. We'll come back to it, maybe. But postpone it indefinitely, and there's, you have to have a second, and that kind of a motion is debatable. So you talk about why. It's like, well, we need more research. We need to find out what a, a Barney costume is going to cost or what the royalties we'd have to pa pay to, to use Captain Planet. And we have to teach all the staff and faculty and the, the students the song. So why don't we just postpone this and then we'll come back in a couple of weeks and bring it back up. Now, if you have a motion like that, it becomes old business. And so later on, you would bring it up. What if you don't ever want to bring it up? Then don't. My opinion is whenever your group is, the, the, has changed, in other words, let's say it was a, a club thing of the 2019-2020 school year, when 2020-2021 school year starts, it's dead. You have to start all over again. And I think that works for student government, programming board, people like that. Uh, my precedent there is that is what Congress does. When they elect a new Congress, anything that they haven't passed has got to be started all over again. That's probably one thing they do right. So, uh, so that's, that's my opinion on that, but you can, we can talk more about that. Do abstention votes count? There's not even really a fill-in on this um, other than that phrase. Uh, do abstention votes count? Abstention is you're here and you don't want to take a position on the matter, so you abstain. So it's like all in favor, aye, all opposed, nay. Any abstentions? Okay, so somebody raises their hand. All right, so they're, they're not voting. Uh, they usually don't have any impact on the vote. It's just you're here and you're uh, not taking a vote. The only time that would be is if your bylaws or your constitution says that you have to pass things by a certain percentage of the members present. So if you're in the room, then you do count. I'll give an example. We had an exa a thing when I was on the international board, a motion. Uh, we had an 11-member board, president who didn't vote, 10 members who were voting. I was a vice president. And the vote came out four in favor, three against, three abstained. Our parliamentarian ruled that the motion passed. But our rules for our board said things had to pass by a majority of the members present. 
10 of us were in the room. So it really took a vote of six to pass that item. Didn't know that at the time, so it passed. We let it pass, and now looking back on it, it should have been defeated. So that's gonna be the weird, rare example where you're gonna have something like that. Okay, so just understand that. Some people think that abstentions go with the majority, they don't. Okay, so how do you determine the result? You take a vote. Usually majority rules, 50% plus one in some cases, like elections, two thirds on more um, serious matters, like removing somebody from office, that 50% plus one can also cause you some issues. One year at our state convention, we were trying to elect our state secretary. We had 33 delegates. Half of 33 is 16 and a half. Can't have half a person. So 17 plus one, we needed 18 to, to pass. And three ballots in a row, the vote came out 17, 16. And under our rules, I wasn't allowed to tell the delegates why we weren't electing somebody. Finally, they figured it out. And so then they did something to caucus them and ask them some questions and then the person won like 25 to eight. But yeah, so sometimes that can happen to you. So resolutions are a common way uh, for student governments particularly to take actions, uh, but or other organizations can do that. It's a way to honor people. It's a way to recognize people. It's the preamble is under the whereas. And I've got an example on your handout from my student government that I'll talk about in a moment. So whereas something, 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 be it resolved that we want something, something, something to happen, and be it further resolved that this is what we want done with it. Okay, everybody got those? Okay, here's the uh, resolution for my student government. It's in your handout, and it was about the Dr. King holiday, so you can see how in the whereases we have the preamble of why we should endorse this. Uh, you would think, you know, nowadays, oh, this was probably a no-brainer, right? It wasn't. There were a lot of states who initially didn't pass this, didn't approve it. Wisconsin was not a very diverse state at that time, so there was kind of not, they weren't against it, they just weren't like, why do we need this? And so we felt it was very important as a student government to go on record saying that we wanted to, to have this holiday created, and this is how we did it. And so then the be it therefore resolved is that, uh, that we endorse the creation of the holiday and be it further resolved was we sent copies of this resolution to the White House, to the governor of the state, our congressional delegation, our state representatives, all of those people. Um, you can do this in the form of bills. This is from the school in Louisiana. They have a, a loan fund in their student government and it was $100. They wanted to raise it to $200. So they talked about some of the reasons why and then in the be it therefore, in the further resolve, they put some rules on it. You can also do this to recognize people. This is a resolution that was done by the city council in Oshkosh, uh, naming a date David A. Kelly Day in recognition of my being international president for Circle K. And so it's whereas Dave is a really cool, awesome guy, and whereas he's done really nice things, and we love him, and he's cool and cuddly and all that, be it therefore resolved that we declare David A. Kelly Day in the city of Oshkosh, Wisconsin, May 31st, 1983. It was just that one day in time. I don't go back every year and there's a parade or anything like that. I mean, there could be, but I'd be the only person in it. So, but that's kind of fun. So those are some things that you can do. Now, the magically mysteriously disappearing motion that I referenced before was a motion that we had when I was the international president. And it was Saturday night, the night before the Baltimore-Boston debate. So we wanted to finish this so we didn't have to deal with it the next morning. I don't even remember what the issue was anymore. But I do remember that we had a motion with an amendment to the motion, with an amendment to the amendment, to the amendment, to the amendment, six deep. I don't even remember what it was down here at the bottom. And everybody's tired, it's after midnight. Oh, we got the Boston thing in the morning. What are we gonna do? And we're going along, and as we're talking about it, one of my board members, Jim, who was Gilbert Cube's best friend, by the way, Jim says, I don't think we should do that at all. Let's do this. And everybody went, oh, like that was the greatest idea ever. And so they all wanted to do that. And I said, cool, but we have this monstrosity over here. And I said, Pete, how do we get rid of this motion and all these amendments? And he said, well, you could go through and you would vote down each amendment, starting with the, the last one, and vote them down and put that vote in the minutes. Oh, that's going to take forever. And he said, or you could go through and have every maker and seconder of every amendment and the main motion withdraw their motions and their seconds and put that in the minutes. Oh, that's going to take longer. And then I turned to the board and I said, okay, we don't want to do this anymore, right? No, we want to do what Jim said, right? Yes. I turned to the international secretary and I said, Glenn, rip that page out of your minutes book and throw it away. And he went, Shh, 
and then Pete went, ah, and I go, Thor, not coming down to hit you with the hammer, not gonna happen. I say this about being practical. Don't let this stuff get you all tied up in knots. At that moment in time, there was really nobody who could give me a really easy solution to doing that. So by executive fiat, I did that. Now again, if you're on a board of a nonprofit or stockholder meeting or something like that, don't do that because you got legal issues in those cases. In that case, everybody was like, no one ever has to know until 20 years later and I started telling everybody about it. Now, someone did ask me one time, what should you have done? I went to something called robertsrules.com. They have an open forum on there where you can post questions. So if you get something really intense that you're not sure of, you can go in there and post on it, and within 24 hours, certified parliamentarians will respond to you. And the response they gave back to me was that I could have allowed the original maker of the motion to withdraw his motion as long as I had unanimous consent. And the reason why you can't normally do that is because the motion belongs to the body once the motion's been made. But in that case, if the rest of the group would let him, which they would have, and essentially that's what happened. I just had him rip the page out of the minutes book. But it really should have stayed in the minutes book and then motion withdrawn. That's what I should have done. Okay. Any questions on any of the stuff I shared with you or maybe other things that have come up that you've been thinking about or things that you've encountered in parliamentary procedure that you'd like to ask about? Oh, okay, go here and then here, yes. So would you uh, describe this or convey this Robert's, the Robert's Rules order, order to a body that is not familiar with it? Good question. How do you convey this information to a body that is not familiar with it? Start with the basics. Start with the motion stuff. Because that's the things that your members can do right away. They can make motions, they can second, they can debate, and they can vote. So I would just start with that section. I have a, 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 a fun and exciting meetings program that I do, and I'll do a little bit of that in there. And so that's what I talk about there, because that's the things they really need to know about. And then if you get into some more complex things, pull out the handout, and then maybe give them copies of it or show it to them and say, all right, this is how we're going to work through this. Okay? Does that help? Yeah. How about you, sir? Good question. He said, for a two-thirds vote, you can't do a voice vote. You have to have them raise their hands. Not necessarily. In a group like this, if it was going to be something that took a two-thirds vote, I could say, all in favor, and I see the hands go up, and let's say it looks like a lot of or even almost all the hands are up, I could say that the motion passed. Now, somebody in the group could question that by asking for a division. And basically, a division means you want to have a more... Um, detailed count. So that would be raise your hands, everybody stand up. Sometimes on voice, voice votes, you get a little confused. Like when we would have those delegate groups with 500 people in them, you would take, all, right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. And then I go, motion fails. And someone goes, division. All right, all those in favor, please stand up. All right, you know, most everybody. All right, sit down. All those against? Three guys on the front row. But they were loud and they were right there, so it sounded like they were more people. So yeah, sometimes you have to do that because you can get, throw, get fooled by a voice vote. So good question. Any other questions? If something, were you gonna raise your hand? I was gonna say that the Constitution mm -hmm. That's true. Sure. Does everybody hear that? That you may be in multiple organizations and you could have different rules like different votes and different ways of doing things. Now, most of the time, there's also a process for amending constitutions and bylaws. So if there's something in your organization that you'd like to change, you as a member have that possibility. And what you would do is, I move that we amend our constitution to this or to change this. 
so you can do that. If you have other questions, my email address and phone number are on the bottom of every page of my handout. Feel free to reach out to me. I have students do it all the time. I'll be happy to answer your questions. And if you have other questions or you'd like to get one of the copies of my book, feel free to come see me afterwards. I thank you all for being here tonight and uh, hope you all have a great night and a great year and do some awesome parliamentary procedure. Meeting adjourned. Not adjourned. <laughs> oh, Emma has something. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.